Uh, good morning, I'm Reverend Daryl Gray. I am the chairperson of the Corrections Task Force. And this is our meeting dated today. Whatever today's date, March the 11th, 2021. I will begin by calling the roll. Dr. Pamela Walker, vice chair. She, I'm yeah. here. <laughs> Alderman, Alderman Jeffrey Boyd, Vice Present. Chair of the, thank you. Brad Hump. Here. Alderman Joe Vaccaro. Present. The Honorable Senator Jamila Nasheed. Present. Mr. Adolphus Pruitt. Present. And I believe that is uh, Miss uh, Tracy Stanton. Reverend Charles Norris. We have two absent, but we do have a quorum. Our meeting is going to go pretty, we're hoping it'll go pretty quick today. We do understand that we have uh, three uh, entities that will be uh, presenting today. We have representatives from uh, the police department, uh, St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, a representative from the St. Louis Circuit Attorney's Office, and uh, Dr. Echols from the Department of Health. And so that will be our agenda today. Uh, at some point after the presentations, uh, I understand there'll be a motion to go into closed session uh, because we do have concerns, uh, security uh, discussions to have regarding uh, the building. So that is the agenda for this morning. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Well, I'll make a motion we approve the agenda. It's Second. been moved by Alderman Vaccaro, seconded by Alderman Boyd. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Uh, the minutes. The minutes were sent out. Uh, Dr. Walker sent the minutes out from our last meeting, meeting, meeting number six, March 5th. Uh, is there a motion to appro approve the minutes with any necessary corrections? So moved. It's been moved by Alderman Board. Is there a seconder? I'll second that. Seconded by Alderman Vaccaro. All in favor of the motion to approve the minutes with any necessary corrections, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Uh, I have an email from Lieutenant, the one of the lieutenants that uh, is supposed to be presenting. Let me check. I think, I thought I saw him on, but he is not. He indicated that he has not yet received, but I did send the information to Ms. Reeves. If you'll give me one second, he is trying to reach me right now. Give me one second, please. I'm very sorry, that was a lieutenant calling. He is gonna call Ms. Reeves uh, to give her the email addresses. We did send that, we sent it over. So I do apologize for the delay. Uh, while we are waiting on the police department representatives to come on board, just a couple of housekeeping things, uh, points. We will be meeting virtual uh, tomorrow. Uh, we won't be at the uh, uh, Criminal Justice Center. Uh, as a task force, we will continue to meet virtual uh, tomorrow. We have tentatively scheduled a meeting uh, with the mayor for tomorrow at one o'clock to present our report if it is completed. Uh, we will be 
in closed session uh, today. We'll be in closed session tomorrow uh, to go over the recommendations. We will come out of closed session uh, to uh, present our disposition on the recommendations tomorrow. Tomorrow's meeting, I, I believe, is scheduled to begin at 11. Uh, and our hope is to uh, complete our meeting uh, in time to meet with the mayor tomorrow at one. And that's if our recommendations are completed. And so we'll discuss that today. Uh, and so uh, today we will go into closed session at some point after the presentations uh, to discuss uh, the recommendations, those that involve security issues. Uh, and then tomorrow we will convene at 11 a.m. And uh, to finish up, uh, we have to come back in session to vote on the recommendations in, uh, in a public forum. If they are completed, uh, then we are tentatively scheduled to meet with the mayor tomorrow at 1 p.m. Hey, Mr. We, Chairman. Yes. I was gonna say, I, we, Dr. Eccles is here. And I was thinking, while we're waiting on the police, why don't we just start with him and bring them in afterwards, if that's okay with you? The only problem I have is that I know that the police uh, have to be out at a certain yeah. time. Yeah. And that's my point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I, I, and I do apologize. I, I'll take full responsibility for the miscommunication. Um, what we're trying to do also, Dr. Mr. Pruitt, is give each person at least 30 minutes. Uh, if, if, and I'm not sure how long they'll be able to stay. They have a, a, a appointment at 11. But you know- No what? need to apologize. <laughs> oh, you're a good No man. need to apologize. This is, this is a technology, technological society and, and things go wrong. And I mean, no need to apologize. We got, Thank we you. got all the time in the world for you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. I appreciate We'd be it. here all night if you asked us to. Ain't that right, Jamila? Oh, <laughs> come on, y'all. Y'all all right. Uh, thank you so much. And, and uh, as, we, as we're going along, on Thursday, March 23rd, uh, Alderman Vaccaro and Alderman Bruce have set up uh, an opportunity for the task force, uh, as we currently exist, uh, to meet with the Public Safety Commission March the 23rd. That's Tuesday, March 23rd at 10.30 a.m. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to present uh, to the Public Safety Committee the recommendations uh, that are approved, uh, the recommendations that are approved that would fall under the authority of the Public Safety uh, Committee. So we want to thank Alderman Vaccaro and Alderman Void Boyd uh, for uh, their, their cooperation and their support, uh, understanding that once the task force is dissolved, that uh, these recommendations still have to be moved. And there are some recommendations that have been determined uh, by the task force as urgent. Uh, and we hope that the mayor will uh, concur with our decision as far as urgency. So I think I just got a text from uh, I understand that the, the the lieutenant doesn't have the capacity to log in uh, through the video, but we'll try to connect. Otherwise, he will call in. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to take Mr. Pruitt's suggestion until he calls in. Uh, and then what we'll do, we'll just have to move them around. So if we have Dr. Echols on, let's go ahead and uh, ask Dr. Echols if he would begin as our first uh Hey, presenting, mm -hmm. and as he's presenting, what I would do is I'll try to reach out to the police, uh, uh, and I know that Miss Reeves is trying Mr. to do the same thing. So, Mr. Chairman, oh, I'm morning. sorry, the lieutenant is on. The lieutenant is on. I'm sorry, he's on. So, uh, lieutenant, I understand that you are on. Excellent. So, uh, let us go ahead and begin. As we mm -hmm. indicated at the beginning, uh, we're trying to. Uh, keep the presenters to around 30 minutes. Uh, and we, as I said, just to refresh, uh, the three topics that were given to us by the mayor uh, to review and to investigate, number one, to investigate the alleged concerns and complaints regarding food, water, temperature, and clothing, uh, the need to begin moving cases through the 22nd Judicial Circuit and any other measures possible to address the isolation and uncertainty resulting from the 
halting of court cases for nearly one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic and to become apprised of urgent building and equipment needs of the facility, which is approximately 20 years old. Uh, we all know that we cannot openly discuss security issues uh, in our private meeting. We're happy that uh, Chief Hayden uh, has responded positively and has made uh, his officers available. And uh, Lieutenant, what I would ask you to do is please state your, your name, your position with the uh, police department. And then we will ask you to share with us the relationship uh, between uh, the police and the CJC as it relates to your duties. And so Lieutenant, thank you very much. You have to come take yourself off the, off of mute. Well, we can, I suppose. Can we take him off of mute? I got it now. Okay. Uh, my name is Pierre Benoist. I'm a lieutenant with the St. Louis Police Department. I am currently the commander of the Warrant and Fugitive Unit, and I've been in this position for approximately four years. Um, I oversee the intake of the prisoners at uh, the first floor. And then once they get to the second floor, they become uh, Department of Corrections property, okay? And alongside me is Sergeant Colin Tully, who runs the day-to-day -day operations at the Justice Center for the police department. And it would probably be best if he would update you on the, um, relationship we've had we have with Dale Glass and the Justice Center if that's okay. That's fine, Lieutenant. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Um I'm Sergeant Colin Tully. I've been the deputy commander of prisoner processing since uh, May of 2018. Um like the lieutenant said, we handle arrestees for the first 24 hours. Uh, basically, of their time at the Justice Center. Um, kind of, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the operations and the difference between corrections and um, the police department and how it works. Has anybody explained that to you yet? No, we would be happy if you would explain okay, that sure. to us. So when someone gets arrested in the city of St. Louis, uh, eventually they end up at the Justice Center. Every single arrestee comes through the Justice Center. Um, when they do, they enter the first floor through the Sally port, um, which is the uh, protected controlled entry uh, for police officers and arrestees. Um, the first thing they do is now they have their temperature taken. Uh, they're then searched and they're placed in a cell waiting to see the nurse. Uh, once they see the nurse and they've been processed, so if needed, they get uh, their fingerprints and photograph taken for a booking. Uh, they then wait to go upstairs. Um, once they get transferred upstairs, we hand over care, custody, and control of the arrestee to the Department of Corrections. Uh, we have a small footprint on the second floor of the Justice Center as well, um, but we do not control any of the cells or the arrestee's movement once they reach the second floor. Um, so that's, that's kind of the gist of, of how operations go at the Justice Center. Um, to speed up our process in the police department, uh, about a year ago, we moved our fingerprinting and photographing operation to the first floor, um, which has sped up the processing of arrestees and helped us release arrestees faster who can be released once they are booked. Um, there's a process called pending application of warrant, which means you are booked and immediately released. Um, so we've sped up that release significantly since moving that to the first floor. Also with the uh, incoming city charges, city arrestees and offenses, um, we're able to release them much faster now that we've moved that down to the first floor. Uh, there is a bit of a, a delay in moving arrestees to the second floor, which sort of slows down the process a bit um, because corrections is understaffed and they don't have the capacity to take arrestees to the second floor quickly. Um, we're also only able to move up four arrestees at a time for safety purposes. Um, and so that slows things down as well. I guess I will ask at this time, I have a couple of questions before um, we ask any task force members if they have questions. We do understand to uh, Lieutenant and Sergeant that you cannot speak to any uh, quote unquote security issues. And so we, we appreciate that. 
Uh, my, my question is regarding, we were able to obtain uh, and speak to it if you can, if you cannot speak to it, we understand, uh, a copy of an internal memo. Uh, it was made public, actually, uh, one of the, the media people, Ms. Christine Byers, uh, did a piece on this some time ago. And uh, in that uh, internal communication, uh, there were things that cited that obviously, you know, caught our attention. Uh, can you speak to any, uh, any part of this internal memo uh, to us as it relates to uh, your concerns uh, about the relationship uh, within the Justice Center as it relates to the police officers. If you can, please do. If you cannot, please state that. So um, I am familiar with the memo you're referring to. Uh, I wrote it, so I'm very, very familiar with, with what's in there. Um, we're having a difficult time communicating with the Department of Corrections. Um, some time ago, it's it. They didn't stop taking our calls, but they just kind of stopped responding to our concerns, questions. Uh, when we would reach out via email, uh, we would get no response back. Uh, for issues such as for an entire eight-hour shift, we're unable to move prisoners to the second floor. Um, then it moved to for two shifts, 16 hours, we couldn't get people up. Uh, those kind of issues are concerning because they keeps the arrestees downstairs and doesn't let them move through the process. And when we try to bring it up with them, uh, there's no response. They've, it's, it, they're not even responding at all saying, we're sorry, we can't help you. It's just, there's no response at all. Um, other safety issues throughout the building that were noted in the memo, um, we've tried to speak to them about and we're not getting any response whatsoever. Uh, Sergeant, what, I'm sorry, yeah, Sergeant, what, was the memo uh, sent to the Department of Corrections or is this simply an inter internal memo? But what, was there anything in writing that was sent to uh, Commissioner Glass and or his representatives uh, indicating the concerns that you raised? Uh, we've sent various emails to them. Um, that memo was an internal memo that I sent okay. to my uh, command staff. Uh, so we didn't send that specifically to them. Um, I believe it was shared with them afterwards uh, by my command staff, um, but there has been written communication via email with the Department of Corrections for quite some time. Um, Can, I'm sorry. Can you elaborate uh, just a little bit more, particularly the first one, Ser and I, I'm quoting the, the memo, serious concerns for the safety of his staff, arrestees, and officers coming and going from the building. Uh, the, when you talk about the, the safety, can you elaborate a little bit more when you say a concern for the safety of staff, arrestees and officers? Yeah, so that was referencing the, the unrest, the, the riots. Um, I believe that was even before the, the latest one, um, but that's, that was in reference to kind of the situation and how it was unfolding and how uh, there were some unsafe things that were happening in the building and you could kind of see it building. Um, whether it be the locks not working as everyone's aware of, uh, certain doors not closing, uh, where arrestees would have direct access to our area on the first floor and then could easily get out of the building. Um, there were cameras that were down that aren't working. Still to this day, uh, attention buzzers aren't working. Um, so I assume some, if not all of you have been through the justice center at one point or another through this process. Uh, if you notice on every door that's controlled by corrections, uh, there's a button, you push a little silver box. that looks like it has a speaker on it. Those are attention buzzers. Uh, they updated the computer system that controls those in October or November of last year. And, uh, that system went down, the attention buzzer system went down and it's still not working today. Um, so that, that kind of makes it difficult for my staff to let people in and out of the, that Sally port and then move them throughout the building. Um, you know, it, it's, I'm concerned with, with the safety of everyone, including the arrestees and just some of those things, um, make me think that it's, it's not as safe as it could be. Okay. And I have one other question, uh, 
You, it was also indicated uh, in the memo, and I quote, one arrestee was kept in isolation on the first floor from 1921 until 1221 because corrections refused to accept him on the second floor. This caused the arrestee to miss his initial appearance in court by no fault of our own. Uh, and so uh, obviously for us, we, we're, we're charged with looking at um, how detainees are moved through the system. We understand the delays, a lot of delays within the court system, a lot of them caused by COVID. We understand uh, that, but we're also charged with looking at what delays may occur as it relates to the process. And so it appears that on, on this, could, could you expound on that just, just a little bit more? Sure. Uh... For various reasons, uh, arrestees are often placed in isolation uh, by the nursing staff at the Justice Center. Um, I don't remember the exact reason that this person was, um, but some of the reasons are COVID exposure, um, some, so, some sort of other communicable disease, uh, detoxes, uh, people who are coming in and need to be detoxed, um, and then somebody who's been deemed a suicide risk. Those, people, those are the kind of some of the reasons that somebody could be isolated. Uh, there's a limited space to isolate people. So oftentimes they're forced to stay on our floor, on the first floor, um, because corrections doesn't have room for them on the upper floors, uh, which is a problem. And it's concerning to me because once I get involved, once I show up and say, hey, this is a problem, we need to move somebody around, oh, then all of a sudden space opens up. Um, so I don't know if it's just a lack of a desire to, to move people around and get the people up or if they actually don't have the space. And I, 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 sometimes it is difficult to understand. Um, in this specific instance, this person had to be in court the next following morning. And because they weren't moved upstairs, they weren't moved through the process and no one would take this person to court, uh, therefore, they missed their court date and had to stay in custody uh, an extra couple of days because the next court hearing was the following, what have you, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so that's, that's an example of that. Uh, people in COVID isolation before this um, and before I spoke to the 22nd Judicial Court um, would miss court for a week at a time and be held in custody. Uh, we've since resolved that issue and now, uh, after this memo and um, after that conversations with the 22nd Judicial, um, the sheriffs and the Department of Corrections will come get someone, anyone from isolation and put them to court. Uh, if they're COVID positive, if they can't be moved, if they can't be handled properly, uh, then they will do an appearance with their attorney. Um, the sheriffs will appear for them. And that case will either be continued or they will re review the facts of the case and issue a bond if they can. Um, so that's something that has been remedied since the memo has been released. Excellent. Uh, I will now ask uh, our uh, task force members. Uh, I, I am looking if if you will, if you have a question, if you just you know raise your hand. I'm going to try to see see everybody that I can. So I'm looking. Are Thank there any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Alderman Vaccaro. So, uh, and and I, I think I was aware of a lot of these different things. But my understanding, did, did they ever fix the Sally door? I, I was told that sometimes they end up bringing the prisoner back to the station because nobody even answers the Sally door. Has that been fixed or? So that's, that would be the attention buzzer issue. Uh, the door, the actual door function works and now the camera has been fixed so we can see people there. Um, so that's good. Uh, but the attention buzzer has not been fixed. Uh, we have to put a sign on the outside of the uh, entrance that says, please call this number. It's the number to our control booth uh, to alert our staff that somebody is outside uh, waiting to come in. Um, so the, the door function actually works, but the, uh, the, the attention buzzer does not. And also that means that our staff can't speak to the incoming uh, officers saying, hey, the, the, the Sally Port's crowded, the, the, you know, what have you, what could be causing a delay. So there's a phone number there that we asked the officers uh, to call, um, but it's it's kind of, I really wish the attention buzzers would work. And the, and the, uh, other, the other question quickly, yeah. is the cameras and prisoner processing, are they finally working? For, my understanding was for quite a bit of while, 
that the cameras in prison processing was not working. There was a, a time when the cameras weren't working. Um, I believe as of right now, all of the cameras are operational uh, as best they can be. There's, there's a couple that are um, older. Uh, and so the picture's not as good as we'd like it to be. Um, but I believe all the cameras are operational, especially the ones on the outside um, where we had the attention buzzer wasn't working. So we weren't able to tell who we were letting in and out. Those, those have been repaired. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Brad Hump, Brad, you have. You have yes, you have I just wanted to clarify for those that are moved to the second floor, it's my understanding that the corrections, I'm not through, sure if that's through mutual agreement or how that came about, but they, they're responsible for observing and the care of those individuals. But are they in corrections custody or still in police custody at that point? Most of them are still in police custody or some variation of police custody. Um, the actual, I, I guess, it, it, it's just, it's so complicated and, and convoluted. Um, they are in our custody as far as what happens with their paperwork and their arrest status. Um, care, custody, and control of them, however, and the responsibility for their well-being falls upon the Department of Corrections, if that makes sense. I understand it's a little confusing, um, but as far as the body goes, and as far as, you know, feeding, showering, and moving, um, and any sort of medical issue, that they would be, the corrections would be responsible for that. Um, as far as them waiting to get through the arrest process, um, presenting the case to the circuit attorney, stuff like that, that falls on the police department. Okay. So there may be some, there may be some custody logistics, legal issues why they can't be moved into corrections at that point then. They can't actually be entered into the jail uh, until they've gone through the sheriff's department, um, I believe is, is there uh, the issue there. Okay, thank you. They have to go before court, um, something like that. All right. Uh, I don't see any hands up, but are there yeah. any other questions? I have one, but I think Jeffrey was before me. Okay. Uh, Alderman Boyd and then uh, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, good morning, Lieutenant. Morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I want you to walk me through a, a couple of scenarios. So let's say you pick somebody up on a warrant from Chesterfield. Um, you, you bring them down to the Justice Center. I, I'm guessing you call Chester and say, hey, I'll pick somebody up on this warrant. How much time are they given before they pick this person up? So there's a couple of things that happen. Immediately the, when the person is picked up on a warrant from Chesterfield, Chesterfield is notified via Regis uh, through Eliweb. Regis is the, the computer system that controls all things warrant and beyond. Um, they're notified via an electronic message that says, hey, we have this person in custody. You have 10 minutes to respond to advise if you're going to pick them up. Uh, generally, a jurisdiction like Chesterfield responds within that 10 minutes and says, yes, we are going to come pick that person up. Um, most times somebody is not picked up on just one warrant from a jurisdiction. Most times there are other things surrounding it. But in your case, let's just say they have the one warrant from Chesterfield. Uh, once they get to the Justice Center, uh, we would, we prisoner processing would advise Chesterfield via this electronic message that the subject is ready for pickup. Uh, and they then have 24 hours to come get them um, and take them to their jurisdiction. Uh, it happens often where jurisdictions aren't able to come within that 24 hours. And we will then send another message that says, you have until the end of business today, four o'clock, three o'clock, what have you, to come pick this arrestee up. If you're unable to do so, we will have to release this individual. Um, we try our best not to hold people, especially for local jurisdictions, longer than 24 hours. Um, if it's an out of town jurisdiction, like out of the St. Louis area, um, we will hold them for additional time if the charges are severe enough. Um, and we've made contact with the jurisdiction to make sure that they can come pick them up. Um, but we are not in the business of holding somebody just to, to wait for Chesterfield. Right. So how often is somebody there longer than 24 hours uh, if they're local? On a local charge? It's very rare. Um, it would have to be a very severe uh, charge for us to hold somebody longer than 24 hours. 
Um, oh. Unless there's, there's been special consideration made by the jurisdiction and the charge is severe enough. Uh, otherwise, we are releasing most people within that 24 hours. And within those 24 hours, they're in police custody, right? That's correct. So who's responsible for feeding them? And maybe they need a shower in between those, within those 24 hours. Whose responsibility is that? Now, that's where you get confusing. Uh, if they're on the second floor, then the feeding responsibility and the shower responsibility would be on the Department of Corrections. Um, if they're on the first floor, we feed on the first floor. Uh, we do not, the police department does not have access to a shower. Um, so you can't shower them. Um, on the second floor, that's where the shower room is and that's where they would be showered. Uh, for a, uh, just a local jurisdiction charge, um, it's rare that they would get or need a shower because they wouldn't be there long enough for just this Chesterfield warrant that you're referring to. Okay, so if someone brought up an incident where somebody was there for a week or two, mm -hmm. you know, waiting for another's jurisdiction, that would just be an anomaly. That's something that potentially slipped through the cracks. Or it didn't happen. I mean, what would be your thoughts? Because we've heard that. Sure. Um, for somebody who waited for just a Chesterfield warrant uh, for a week or two, that would certainly be an anomaly. Uh, I'm not familiar with a case where that would have happened. Now, I, I there are times when people from out of the out of the St. Louis area would find would be waiting for longer than that. Um, but again, we, we do our best and due diligence to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, a case where somebody could be waiting for another jurisdiction uh, would be individuals waiting for Missouri probation and parole. Um, that's another jurisdiction that that is a problem. And there are people who wait a week or two at a time in the holding tanks on the second floor, waiting for Missouri probation and parole to make a decision. Um, that's not the Chesterfield warrants. That's a different set of circumstances that I, I can get into if you'd like, Alderman. But, but that was going to be my, my subsequent question because okay. um, if you pick somebody up on a probation or parole, so if you pick somebody up on a parole issue, that's the state uh, uh, probation and state parole board or whatever jurisdiction. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And, but if you pick somebody up on a probation violation, typically that's something the local the circuit court can that have to deal with. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So if you get picked up on a probation violation, uh, let's say your case was from probation out of the city of St. Louis, your offense occurred in the city of St. Louis. Uh, we put you on what's called the confined prisoner list. We send that over to the 22nd judicial and you go to court, next available court hearing, um, so let's say you got arrested today, which is Thursday, uh, you would go to court tomorrow, which is Friday. Um, if you got arrested Friday, you would go to court on Monday. Um, if you got arrested Monday, you go to court on Wednesday. Um, that would be a probation. Now, somebody would have to wait for another jurisdiction if, say, your offense occurred in Jefferson County. So you're on probation out of Jefferson County. We would then have to transfer you to Jefferson County so you can see the judge in Jefferson County. Um, there are some delays and we just had to release an individual uh, earlier this week because Jefferson County didn't get us their paperwork in time uh, and the arrestee was just kind of sitting in limbo and uh, we don't allow that to happen. So we contacted Jefferson County and said, I'm sorry if you can't pick this gentleman up, we have to release them. Um, and Jefferson County understood and said, okay. Um, parolees, Aldermen are a completely different, uh, a different thing, and it, it does get convoluted. I can explain that if you'd like. Yeah, just yeah, if you can, and shortly. I don't want to take up everybody's time. Sure, so I understand. Um, a parolee gets arrested, and they don't go to court. Uh, the the jurisdiction over what happens with their case is with the parole board, so they need to be interviewed by the parole officer, and then their case needs to be presented to the parole board, which takes some time and delay. Unfortunately. Um, corrections doesn't see them as their prisoners, so they won't take them into the facility. So they sit in a holding tank on the second floor, just a mass holding tank uh, for days, weeks at a time um, with everybody else. That's, that's kind of the biggest issue with is people waiting um, in, in a circumstance, that's, that's what's happening. Okay, so you basically confirmed, you know, what we've been told. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's, it's definitely something we got to fix. So.
Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, Mr. Pruitt? Yeah, Lieutenant. Uh, no, this is the sergeant. That's the sergeant. Yes, sir. Yeah. Lieutenant Sears. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's my question. You are the lieutenant. I want to make sure I understand. On the first floor, when you process a prison, you bring somebody in, arrestee, you go to the, what you call the Sally, whatever, and you down there on that first level, they, that first level is your, is the police department's responsibility or is that shared responsibility? We are the only agency that is there. We are the agency that controls everything that happens there uh, as far as physical stuff. So uh, cameras, locks, door buzzers, and cleaning uh, that falls on the Department of Corrections as a facility operation. But we control all of the day-to-day, -day, uh, the movement, the prisoners, the computers, all that stuff, that's all the police departments. Um, and is responsible just for the facilities and cleaning and the maintenance. Yeah, and, and so when you have someone down there and, uh, and, you say, and, they, and you do the feeding down there, and you said they won't let them go up to the first, the second floor. And they've been down there, say, for 20 hours or 24 hours. Do you release them? Because they never made it to the second floor. They're still down there sure. with you. Sure, yes. Um, if we can release them, if it's an offense that we can release them, um, if they don't need to go to court, if, you know, we can release them from that floor. Um, generally, the people that are waiting there for 24 hours and beyond are people who need to go to court, uh, are people who we just can't release, and so therefore we don't. Can you give me an example of a charge that someone would have that could not be released in that 20 hours? I'm trying to understand. Sure, any, anything that requires them to go to court is, is, or have a warrant, which would have to, they'd have to go to court, is something that we wouldn't be able to release somebody on. So it could, it could be literally anything. Um, that we would have to hold somebody for. So as a minor city offense, city level charges, um, people that don't have to go to state court, uh, we could release those individuals and we do. Um, and then anything that's booked, any arrestee that's booked pending application of warrant, uh, which means they can be released and the officer takes the case to the circuit attorney at a later date, uh, we can release those individuals as well. Um, and as I said, some of the people who need to go to other jurisdictions. Um, we can release them if we contact the jurisdiction because they're unable to pick them up in time. Um, so those are the types of people that we can release. Anybody who has to go to court, unfortunately, we cannot release them. So, so I, I wanna make sure I understand. You pick an individual up on the street, you suspect that they committed a crime. You take them to the first floor. You file, and I'm assuming you don't file for charges with the uh, circuit attorney's office until you take them to the first floor and process them, or do you file prior to that? They, for the for the most part, they are not charges are not filed with the circuit attorney's office until the arrestee has come through the justice center. Okay, so you got them on the first floor. You and and does a clock this clock twenty hour twenty four hours clock does it start ticking from the moment of arrest, the moment process? or the moment you file for, for, for warrants? The 24 hour clock starts ticking when the arrest is made. The arrest- When the arrest. Yes, okay. so whenever the officer deems that the arrest has been made, they document that and that's when their 24 hour clock starts ticking. Now, if somebody is booked, they are not booked pending application of warrants. Uh, they are just booked, we call it a straight charge. Um, so let's say somebody uh, steals something and they're booked for stealing. Uh, and their arrest time is 9.39 a.m. Uh, if by 9.39 a.m. the next morning, no charges have been filed with the circuit attorney, no decision has been made and it's just open, uh, we release that individual immediately. Nobody stays in custody on an open charge for more than 24 hours. Right, and so so you get them, that's, you say stealing, I don't care what the crime is. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that that person's committed a crime, you take them to the first floor and process them, you apply for warrants to the circuit attorney's office. When 24 hours hit, if you have not received anything back from the circuit attorney's office, do you release them regardless of the reason for the arrest? Yes, if, even if the charge is the most severe charge you can think of. If we don't have any 
charging information from the circuit attorney, they are released immediately. No one is held on an open charge for more than 24 hours. Okay, and the last question I have is, you mentioned that, um, wait a minute, I got one before the, the last one. Let me go back one more time about this first floor. So you, and you, you have control of them on the first floor. Of course, you don't have clean the building, you don't do all the other stuff, but you feed them. And, and that control is only for those 24 hours. And if for some reason, the circuit attorney does say, we, we won't charge this, we file charges. And now, they, now you, they had to go before court for a hearing or whatever. And you cannot get them up to the second floor. You're still just responsible for feeding them or do you try to deal with any other needs they may, in other words, if they need medicine, or, or, you know, they may not have had the chance to get their medicine from home or whatever. Do you, are you responsible for making sure that corrections deal with all those other issues? Or do you as the police department have to deal with them because they're still down there in your space? Anybody who's in our space on the first floor, we are responsible for their care. And so if they need medicine, we make sure they get their medicine. If they, yeah. if they have a medical emergency, we make sure that they're cared for properly. Um, you know, it's just everything within our ability. So we can't shower somebody. We don't have a change of sure. clothes, things like that. But anything in our ability to make sure that they're cared for properly, the police department, when they're on our floor, we take care of them. Uh, yeah, and my, my last question is this. Yes. You said that when the memo came out, well, all of that, you went to the courts and it was the courts who intervened to ensure that you got the relief you needed from the Department of Corrections or the courts came up with a solution to the problem with you guys as relates to that issue. Am I right? Did, did I hear that right? That was one specific issue with getting an arrestee to court who was in isolation. Um, we worked with the 22nd Judicial since they, it was their uh, hearing um, and they, th we worked out a solution to make sure that every arrestee could go to court regardless of their isolation status. Yeah. All right. I'm done, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Senator Nasheed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lieutenant, how are you this morning? Doing well. Thank you. Good. What, what it seems like to me is, that, hold on for one second here. What it seems like to me, it seems like we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have too many chiefs and not enough Indian. And as a result, this is a, a ball of dysfunctionalism. Uh, so, you know, my question to you is this here. Uh, or you, do you know who actually wrote the internal uh, memo? I did. Okay. And uh, I can say that those were some scathe, scathing criticisms for, from, for the Department of Corrections, okay, for the, the Corrections um, Justice Center, right? So my question to you is this here. What are you... What, what's your ideal of making, making this here uh, work where all of you all can work collectively together for the betterment uh, of the uh, detainees as well as the safety of the correctional officers and the, uh, uh, the police officers that are working there? Because uh, again, those were scathing criticisms. And if you have mm -hmm. that type of dysfunctionalism, it's, I mean, if the head is not in order, the body's not gonna follow. OK, and I see and I think that that's this here. What we're hearing is a direct correlation to what I believe caused the uprise. OK, and so what I'm asking you, what recommendations would you have moving forward? OK, uh, in assuring that everyone is working in alignment, OK, on, on, on the same accord so that we can have a functional system, because right now it's dysfunctional. Okay, and so you are a leader and I'm asking what recommendations would you have moving forward uh, that we probably can even put in our report uh, to give to the mayor in order for us to be able to have a more, you know, cohesive and a unified approach to the criminal justice system uh, with he within the city of St. Louis. Uh, the first thing we need to do is everybody talk to each other and communicate um, and make sure that everybody is operating on the same page with the same understanding of what's happening in the building. 
Uh, I think there's too much of, of a divide between the three organizations who operate within the building. Uh, it's the police department, the sheriff's department, and the Department of Corrections. Uh, I know the city is working on a, a memo of understanding uh, where we all agree whose roles or what and where they are. Um, I don't think that's enough because I don't, at this point, I don't think anybody is willing to communicate with the other parties. Um, the police department, we're here, we're open, you know, we're willing to talk to anybody. We're just not getting a good response from the other members. So I think that's first and foremost, what we need to do. Everybody needs to, to agree that we have to communicate and that's, that's gonna solve a major issue. When the police department has an issue, um, we'd like to be able to communicate with somebody from corrections to explain that. And then we all work together on the same team to make sure that works. Um, with, when the police department has an issue with the sheriff's department, I'd like for us all to be able to sit down and talk and kind of get together and, and, and all work on the same team. Um, I'm not sure why communication has fallen off so much, but that's, if we can start doing that, we can solve every single issue that has happened in the justice center. Um, so what you're basically saying is there needs to be some co-operabilities, right? Yes, All yes, right, across the board. Yes, okay, and so isn't it true to say that the Department of Correction falls up under the mayor? Yes, ma'am. Isn't it true to say that uh, the police department now that we have local control of the police falls up under the mayor? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So we need a, a certain level of leadership, okay, in order to be able to bring those two heads together. Not saying that uh, the, the current mayor is not, you know, giving us the leadership that's needed, but there needs to be some concrete leadership to be able to say, listen, just like you said, we have to work across the board and make sure that everybody is having that cooperabilities where they can communicate effectively for the betterment of uh, uh, safety and, uh, and detainees. Uh, so you sent that memo out. Who responded to, to you from the Department of Corrections? To date, I've not received any communication from the Department of Corrections about anything. Okay. And did you um, articulate that to uh, the chief or the um, public safety director? I have not personally. I, I directed my response to Lieutenant Benoist, who directed it up the chain of command. Um, so I, did, she, hold on, did, Lieutenant, did, did Lieutenant give that information to the chief or the uh, public safety director? I did not. I forwarded, I followed the chain of command and forwarded it to my captain. Did your captain, did your captain give it to the, uh, the, uh, the public safety director or-, or I am chief? not aware, I am not aware of that. And see, and see, I think that this that's what's happening. Uh, if, if we, if you all, if you all, if you send out a memo and you don't know how far that memo got re reached uh, the top ladder, uh, then that's a, that's a problem within itself, okay? Because we then start blaming, you know, the heads, and the heads probably know nothing about it because they they probably never received the memo, okay? And so I'm saying that at the end of the day, there needs to be a follow up and follow through. OK, and hopefully we get the opportunity to talk to uh, the uh, public safety director and the public safety because if the pu public safety director knew about any of this, I'm sure that he probably would have taken that to the uh, mayor to be, be able to come together and figure out, you know, how can we build this uh, relationship between the Department of Corrections and, and the police department? Because, I mean, it's, it's broken. It's broken and, and we can and the world can see that it's broken. I mean, we, we made national news here, so we have to fix what's broken, and I think that that's why we're here today. Uh, but thank you for, uh, um, you know, answering some of my questions. Okay, uh, right. ma'am, uh, just, uh, just to be clear, everything in that memo, they were all, it was all off emails that were sent to Dale Glass, Hayes, and Adrian Barnes at the Department of Corrections. They're well aware of what's going on there. And they're well aware of our concerns because we've documented everything. So, you know, I think it's our part is we are very open to this. I, I see a mismanagement part at the Justice Center. Okay. And what I see and getting back to the parolees, 
Myself, Judge Edwards, and Chief Hayden sat in a meeting over a year ago concerning these parolees. And the issue is who's going to convey them back to state prison when the board says you're going back, okay? And Judge Edwards, myself, and Chief Hayden all agree that it's not the department's job to do that. We've never done that. So that's why they are sitting there for up to 30 days sometimes, okay, and not being transported because no one is transporting them back to jail, okay? That's where the link is broken. Uh, can I amend my uh, comments, Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Then we're going to move forward. Okay, then we'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, and I understand because, you know, we've, we've had, uh, we've been having these meetings here and we, what we're hearing is like back and forth. You know, it's like, uh, it's like kids fight, brothers and sisters fighting, okay? And, uh, and, and, and blame it on each other, you know, who started it, okay? So what I'm saying that at the end of the day, it's not about you, you telling us that you sent a letter to the commissioner. We have to go to the top in order to fix a problem that's at the bottom. And, and, and until we're able to do that, uh, only then will, will the brothers and brothers be fighting with each other. And the mother or the father will have to get involved and bring them to the table and sit them down and say, look here, this is how you're going to work together, right? And we haven't seen that thus far. So hopefully as a result of this commission, I mean, uh, this here uh, uh, board, this works, yeah, yeah uh, this ta uh, task force, we hope that, that what comes out of this is a certain level of respect among you know, the uh, different departments, as well as a broader uh, communication moving forward so that we can begin to understand how we fix the system. Because again, I keep saying it, the system is broken and it's dysfunctional. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I agree, but in the police department, there's a chain of command and my chain is not to go around my captain to my colonel to the chief. My chain is to go to my captain and then present it to him and let them move forward with it. Okay, for the record, for, the, for, the, for our records, uh, in speaking to Chief Hayden, uh, as he uh, identified the officers that would speak today, Chief Hayden is aware of the, of the memo. So it has reached the top chain, as, uh, the top person in the chain as far as the police. So for the record, Chief Hayden is familiar uh, with the memo. Uh, for the record, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Glass has indicated to the task force uh, that he was not aware uh, and that when I asked for the memo, uh, Commissioner Glass suggested that I contact the police because they wrote it, which is why I contacted the police. Uh, that's in our records. And so finally, I wanna ask uh, the, the two officers at the end of your memo, you indicated, you suggested some recommendations. I'd like to read those into the record. Uh, number one, Justice Center uh, is critically, and th these are your quotes, Justice Center is critically understaffed and or existing staffing is not properly utilized. Number two, City Corrections Justice Center is leaving critical, critically fixed security positions unstaffed. Number three, Repair Justice Center second floor security door. Four, repair attention buzzers. Five, repair the camera for the exterior pedestrian doors. Those were the recommendations that you submitted uh, as a part of your memo. Uh, do you, you stand by those recommendations? Yes. All right. And, and some of them may have already been, been adhered to based upon the, the, the uh, the memo uh, being sent, I, I, we don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll ask those questions, but I just wanted to make sure that those recommendations became part of our minutes so that they could be part of our discussion moving forward with recommendations. Do any of the other task force members have any questions of the officers before we move forward? Mr. Chair, I, I just have one comment. Right. Um, uh, and that is, is that I, I'm, I'm a little confused. It is not at their level. But the CCJC exists to deal with exactly with what a Senator Nasheed has brought up and the complaints that they brought up. All of these, all of these different agencies and departments are sitting at the table with the sole purpose as the CCJC 
to deal with these sort of issues and to work in a collaborative way. And so I, I think that we need to make note that, that if these sort of issues are happening, that the, the CCJC either is functional or dysfunctional because all of them are at the table together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, I'm Senator uh, Nasheed, did you indicate, Brad, did you have a question or a comment before we move to Dr. Eccles? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, any other task force members, do you have any questions of the officers? Just one, one quick one. <clears throat> My concern is always the medicine. So someone like me who, you know, I, 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 you know with diabetes, I have to have them shots, not like a day or two or even 20 hours. So when someone comes in with medical needs and the family says, gee, this person needs, you know, like, like with me with heart bypass and I take like a handful of pills. How long does it take? Because I mean, you're talking like in my case, I have probably six different prescriptions that I take. Um, and, and some of them are critical, some of them. Alderman, can I, can I, I'm sorry, can, I, I need to get you to ask your question. But that is the question. Okay. You know, the question is how long does it take to get those medicines? I mean, you know, again, it's some that are critical. So the first thing someone does once they've been searched at the Justice Center to see a nurse, it was at that time that they would be able to explain what medicines they're on if it wasn't brought with them. Uh, and then it's on Corizon, the nursing company, to get those medications administered. Uh, if it's something that needs to be administered right away, uh, the nursing staff will take care of it. Uh, even if it's on the first floor, we have a nurse on the first floor. If they move to the second floor, uh, they see the nurse at least once a day. Uh, sometimes it's twice a day. My, my understanding is they won't let you bring the medicines in. You can bring your medicine in. You can, okay. Yes. It's different than what I was told by Dale Glass, so. We, if, if you, uh, Alderman, if you came in with a bag full of medicine or a handful of medicine, we would, as long as you had the proper prescription with you and it was in the prescription bottles, we package that separately. Uh, and we even leave the package open when we give it to the nurse so the nurse knows exactly what medication you need. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, seeing that there are no other questions, officers, thank you very much for your uh, presentation this morning. Uh, we, we've made it very clear that we, we take our responsibility here as task force members very seriously, and we're trying to get as much information as we can so that we can uh, make sure that we present to the mayor uh, what we believe are proper, proper recommendations moving forward. So thank you again very much. You gentlemen, be safe. Be safe out there. Thanks, Reverend. Thanks, everybody, Thank for you your all. time. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to the next presenter. I know Dr. Eccles is on. Uh, and after Dr. Eccles, I know that Mr. Uh, Christopher uh, Hickley is, is on as well from the uh, Circuit Attorney's Office. And we do appreciate, first of all, their patience. Uh, Dr. Eccles, you were first in the queue. So we're, we're going to go ahead and, and go with you now. Uh, if you'd be so kind, uh, Dr. Eccles. Sure. Um, so, All right, um, thank you. Thanks so thank much you, for, this, for the opportunity to, pre to present information to, um, to the task force. Um, so I'll start by giving a little history on the relationship between the health department and the, uh, and the Justice Center. So at the start of my tenure, I realized that the health department needed to play a critical role in, um, uh, in some aspects of the uh, justice services. Um, so because before I started with the health department, that was the outbreak of tuberculosis, and I helped lead that investigation um, with uh, Corizon Healthcare, which is the organization that is um, contracted to provide medical services for um, uh, inmates. And so um, that relationship was already there. And so after I started as the um, director of health, I reached out to Dale Glass, Commissioner Glass uh, to make sure that we had a good line of communication and that we were able to um, discuss and address any issues that will come up related to health. <clears throat> Um, particularly for COVID-19, I know that's kind of the focus now. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, um, so back in January um, of 2020, um, I held uh, a meeting with all of our stakeholders, which includes you know, fire EMS, um, local, other local health departments, the state, um, to make sure we had a plan in place. Uh, and then also reached out directly to Commissioner Glass at that time to make sure that um, there will be a plan in place to protect the health of inmates and staff. 
Um, the ultimate goal was to make sure that we were able to um, implement uh, guidelines that were established by the Centers for Disease Control, again, with the intent being to um, protect the health of inmates. Um, over the last year or so, um, the City of St. Louis Justice Center has done an amazing job of protecting the health of inmates. They've had uh, roughly around maybe 100 cases of uh, COVID-19 um, in, in the jail. Um, uh, and um, that alone is, is really uh, an amazing feat. If you see what's ha what has happened in prison systems across the state of Missouri, as well as across the country, um, there have been uh, other uh, uh, institutions have been plagued by um, outbreaks of COVID-19, which impacts not only their operations, but also the health of uh, uh, individuals that they're responsible for. And so we made sure that we were able to implement um, guidelines that were established by the Centers for Disease Control, um, everything from uh, making sure there were proper cleaning protocols in place, uh, making sure that um, uh, individuals could isolate and quarantine. So for those individuals who tested positive, make sure there was a space in, med in the medical uh, suite for them to isolate from others. Um, and also we wanted to make sure people who were exposed to those individuals um, were also pulled away from the general population in the event that they did get infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. So by having these, pro these protocols in place, we were able to inter uh, interrupt transmission within the jail. Um, uh, and um, but there are some un unintended consequences that occurred because of that. So because of the isolation and quarantine protocols, um, they weren't able to do recreation like they did in pre-COVID times because of the risk of just transmission. Um, but we also had to make sure that the, uh, the staff um, were doing what were holding up their end of the deal so that they weren't, they wouldn't bring in COVID-19. Because when you look at congregate living, living facilities such as jails, long-term care facilities, uh, the biggest threat is uh, staff who are working because they're going in and out of the facility and they have been exposed to different things outside of the uh, institution. And so um, uh, part of my initial meeting with uh, Commissioner Glass and his team was really to outline the importance of making sure staff understood their role in protecting the health of inmates and themselves and their families. Um, and because of that, and the way the information was communicated to uh, not only the inmates, but also to um, the staff, uh, they did a good job of protecting, um, protecting the health of those that they're responsible for. Um, but again, there were some un unintended consequences. So again, um, having reduced time for recreation um, can lead to mental health related issues. And so we were aware of that. We saw, looked at the recommendations that were provided by um, in the report that was uh, submitted the other week. And so um, actually on yesterday, I went to uh, the Justice Center to meet with uh, Commissioner Glass and his team to kind of talk through some of the recommendations that were made and, and um, how we could work to improve the mental health and overall health of uh, inmates that are still in the facility. Um, so one of the recommendations that came up was uh, for uh, easing restrictions as relates to um, uh, recreation, particularly increasing the number of individuals. And so um, because of uh, the majority of individuals in the jail system at this point in time are not eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. There's still <laughs> a risk um, that transmission could occur if, if SARS-CoV-2 is introduced. We have to be mindful of the variants that are uh, um, circulating in our community as well, which spread more efficiently uh, than the initial variant that was detected. And so um, because of knowing that fact, um, the, the jail population is still, um, uh, there, there's still a risk for them to be exposed and to spread it within this facility. And so not going back to pre-COVID recreation standards, but um, I think at this point in time, they could increase the number of individuals who rec who um, engage in recreational activities at, at a particular time to 15 um, and for an hour at a time. So doing uh, rec the recommendation from the health department will be uh, 15 individuals uh, for one hour uh, twice a day. Um, and this is uh, important. So limited limiting it to 15 individuals is important because you're able to do conduct contact tracing. So in the event that someone does test positive, um, then you're able to, you know which group they were, um, that which group would have been exposed. And so you're able to isolate them um, from the general population. Um, um, having the entire floors out, which I believe is like 30 individuals, um, that could be a huge, a huge task. I don't believe the medical unit has enough to accommodate uh, that many individuals. And so uh, being, being mindful of the capacity of the jail as well as the medical um, infrastructure, um, I think 15 is a reasonable um, uh, number. And again, thinking about contact tracing and being able to uh, inter interrupt the transmission of COVID-19 um, is really important. And so that's why, that's why that recommendation is being made. Um, other other actions that have been other steps that have been taken by the um, by Commissioner Glass and his team 
to improve mental health have been uh, making uh, uh, free phones, uh, free phone calls available to inmates. So I think they have 60, uh, 60 minutes per week and they can break that up however they want. It can be four calls for, uh, for 15 minutes at a time, or they can have their entire hour uh, taken up on a particular day. Um, but if they can, you know, increase the number of minutes that are, uh, an inmate is allowed, um, that could also be helpful. Um, uh, video visitation is something that has um, been discussed as well. You know, on uh, May 22nd is when they plan to have that in place. But um, uh, in-person visitation does have its own risks, risk. Um, however, we can um, implement a, a plan to, uh, I guess, re uh, bring um, in-person visitation back into the jail. Um, and what we will, uh, the, based on the current infrastructure in the jail, the uh, most ideal way to do that is by um, cutting the, the number of visits in half because there's four stations per housing unit. And so instead of having four people per housing unit or four visits per housing unit, it's limited to two. That way individuals who are, who are visiting from the outside can socially distance um, and um, uh, socially distance themselves while they're visiting um, uh, the individual that's that's incarcerated. Um, along those lines, they will, they will need uh, additional capacity um, to make sure that those areas are properly cleaned, um, because as you uh, as an individual uses the telephones and the, the uh, visitation stations, we'll need to wipe those. Those will need to be wiped down according to CDC standards, and so they will need additional staff to monitor that. Um, and that's uh, I discussed that with Commissioner Glass on yesterday. And so one way that um, they could potentially uh, fund those positions is through the um, coronavirus relief funds, and so that's. Uh, an op uh, that will be an opportunity there. Um, uh, the phased in visitation um, process should be should be relatively smooth if they have the uh, proper staffing uh, in place. Um, um, for mental health, they've also um, they do more regular mental health checks um, in the different housing units, um, and that has uh, increased drastically over the. Uh, um, during the pandemic. And so um, those that still remains in place. One thing that they hadn't uh, discussed uh, or thought about was telehealth visits. So one thing that the health department sponsored for some of the federally qualified health centers is a um, telehealth improvement project. And so again, we could use uh, coronavirus relief funds to uh, give the inmates ability to uh, give the medical systems and medical uh, staff not uh, the ability to uh, conduct telehealth visits for the inmates while they're in um, uh, um, in their in their units, and so um, I believe every inmate will have um, um, a tablet, and so they will just need to upload the tablet, the software on that tablet, and make sure it's compatible with the, with the system that's already in place, uh, and that will help ensure more timely communication between the inmates and the medical staff in the event that something uh, is going wrong, if there's an urgent issue, or there's something that they just need to have a, um, a, a an official or formal medical opinion on, they can um, have the telehealth visit as an option. Um, that way, staff, if the staff are, on, are, are off site, uh, they can still um, engage and provide medical um, uh, oversight for the individuals using that platform. Um, in the different housing units, so it's, we talked about cleaning a lot. So there's, there are cleaning protocols in place. Um, uh, each uh, housing unit is cleaned hourly by the working staff. Um, they also have bi-weekly spraying by uh, Woodard. Um, and this, is, this has been done uh, for several months now, and this will continue moving forward. Um, uh, and and they all, the water also sprays the open spaces and the, uh, the uh, common areas in the, in the jail. Um, and uh, one other measure that they put in place was they install air purifiers to help with um, ventilation and um, the quality of air uh, in the facility. And so uh, those are the, the, the major thing that we've looked at. Again, the, um, Commissioner Glass and his team, they've done an amazing job implementing uh, the health department's recommendations over the um, uh, the past year or so to control the spread of COVID-19. And that's evident in the um, uh, the number of cases that have been uh, detected uh, amongst inmates. Um, but again, st we're still not out of the woods yet. And so we, we're making sure that we uh, progress in a safe and responsible manner, knowing that one, you know, most of the, uh, most of the inmates right now are not eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and we have these other variants that are circulating in our community that spread more efficiently than the initial variant that was detected. And so, again, I have a good uh, good communication with Commissioner Glass. You know, whenever something comes up, we we talk with this. You know, they need information from someone who's uh, being uh, admitted, and they state that they uh, tested positive for COVID-19. They contact my office. We look them up in the system to verify or 
uh, reject that information uh, to make sure that they're maintaining a safe environment, not only for their staff, but also for a uh, new person that are coming in and also the general population that's already there. So again, they've done an amazing job. Um, the recommendations I mentioned, as I stated before, uh, are consistent with CDC's guidelines and a lot of the things that um, CDC has recommended are already in place. And so we'll continue to communicate with Commissioner Glass moving forward uh, to make sure again that they're able to maintain a safe and healthy environment for the inmates and their staff. Thank you very much, Dr. Echoes. I only have one, one question right now and then we'll ask other task force members. Uh, your, your department is responsible for, uh, I guess, inspections in CJC uh, just as it relates to the facility cleanliness, stuff, those types of things. How often uh, is the CJC inspected, uh, inspected as it relates to, and some of these may not apply, but our, our preview is food, water, temperature, and clothing. Uh, uh, in that regard, if, if the inspections relate to any of those issues, food, water, temperature, or clothing, number one, and this number two, how often uh, is, the, is the building inspected by you? Um, and, and then once it's inspected, where, do, where does your findings go? Your findings would go back to the commissioner or where? So um, the, uh, the facility, because they run a kitchen, is um, inspected regularly by our food safety program. Um, and when they do that inspection, they're looking at the um, proper storage and handling of food. We also look at um, uh, the water temperature. So that's something that we look at as well uh, to make sure that it's um, uh, at a temperature that can help them properly clean um, their utensils and resources. Um, and that's done regularly. Um, I know it's done at least annually, but then if we have a special request to come over um, to look at a particular situation, um, my staff are available to do that. <clears throat> um, after each inspection, um, my staff formulates a report. Uh, that report is not only given to me, but it's also given back to um, the uh, leadership of the Justice Center. So um, I'll make sure it gets to Commissioner Glass um, and, and his staff um, to make sure there's an open line of communication. And then if there's any issue that we need to discuss, um, we're always available to have uh, either you know, a, a virtual meeting or in some cases, a socially distant in-person meeting um, to discuss those as well. Dr. Eccles, what is, once, once you send your findings back to, uh, back to corrections, is, is there a mechanism uh, for, for you to follow up? Because you indicated the, 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 the annual visit, uh, but let's say something, you, you identify something's wrong and you send that, send that back, the findings back to corrections. Mm -hmm. What mechanism is used to follow up to see if your observations say something needs to be done or carried out? It's similar to what we do for other uh, institutions. So if we identify an issue or area that needs to be uh, addressed or they need to take some action, to, <clears throat> um, we'll follow up with them. We'll do a secondary visit to follow up to see if the, they have remedied the, the issue. Um, and so again, that's why the communication between uh, the health department, Commissioner Glass and his staff is really important to make sure everyone understands what the root cause of the issue is so it can be properly addressed. Right, and then my last question, uh, as we've talked to corrections, uh, the detainees and or staff, uh, one of the areas of concern for us has been that second floor, uh, uh, the access number of detainees allegedly that are, 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 are kept on that second floor, uh, problems with uh, not being able to shower or one toilet or over capacity, it, it, is that something that your department would review, particularly the second floor and the concerns that have come out of that second floor area? So if we when we receive health related concerns to any to part of the Justice Center, I reach out to Commissioner Glass and then you know if we need to look into it, we'll look into it. Um, and then we'll also, um, oftentimes things can come up over the weekend. And so his staff, he'll have the, either the facilities management staff come in and take a look at it um, just to verify to see if there is an issue. And if there is, um, he'll let me know. And then if there isn't an issue, um, but maybe there's something that just need to be tweaked, um, he'll uh, let me know that as well. And so again, um, our communication has been really, um, really strong, um, not just during business hours, but after business hours when you know uh, issues, issues commonly arise, especially related to health. Um, and so, and our goal is to make sure that line of communication remains uh, in place uh, for the um, indefinitely, um, because we do have to work together to make sure we're properly protecting um, uh, those who we're responsible for. 
Have you had any direct communication as it relates to the second floor uh, regarding any health issues at all? Um, to your knowledge. That was, that was one rep there was one call I got on a Saturday while I was in the office and um, it was regarding um, one of the toilets not working or what have you. And so then, um, so I reached out to Commissioner Glass, he had his staff go look into it. And then, so what they ended up doing, they did find that there was some uh, issues with the plumbing. And so they ended up move, relocating some of those individuals to another, uh, to another uh, seller unit. And so um, again, that's why communication is really important. You know, we get um, health department receives um, uh, some complaints from uh, individuals in the community, as well as sometimes we receive letters. Okay. And so I make sure that um, that information is relayed back to uh, Commissioner Glass so we can take any necessary action. Thank you, Dr. Echoes. Alderman Boyd, you have a question? <clears throat> You're on mute. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Echoes. Good morning, how you doing? Good, thank you for all your hard work during this pandemic. I know you're pretty busy, you probably don't get a lot of sleep. Um, and, and for us business owners, thank you for extending to midnight, that was helpful. <laughs> uh, I have a, so let's talk a little bit about the health services at uh, the Justice Center. Who technically is responsible for overseeing uh, the health services that are provided? Um, so the health services that are provided are by Horizon Health, so it's under contract. And so um, Commissioner Glass and his team uh, oversees that contract. Okay, so um it's kind of odd uh they're not healthcare specialists so how would they know if the inmates are being given quality care so as part of the review so um, i participated in the review panel uh for selecting the actual vendor and so um and i engaged with uh horizon health horizon staff on a regular basis but yeah that response the responsibility of overseeing uh, corrections medicine isn't um, under the uh, isn't the responsibility of the health department as it stands right now. Okay, let me ask you this: in a in, in a traditional city, big city per se, where they have a county where the county is responsible for health service, like St. Louis County, who would provide is the is the medical service in a jail typically contracted out, or would that county provide those medical services? It all depends on that jurisdiction. So, for example, in uh, St. Louis County. Uh, the county health department is responsible for overseeing um, corrections medicine operations. Uh, but in some other jurisdictions, they will contract. Actually, in a lot of other jurisdictions, they'll contract it out. Um, uh, so it all depends on the jurisdiction and the, and the uh, desire for that jurisdiction to either own corrections medicine operations or to have uh, another vendor come in and provide those services. Uh, so I'm just thinking of an idea. You know, if, if there's concerns about people complaining that they're not getting adequate you know, medical care, um, could the health department audit per se, you know, just kind of go in and do a random audit, ask questions, interviews, and look at files and just to, to validate that people are getting good care. Is that I mean, something that's possible? I think that's something that could be possible. However, I would request additional staff to help with that capacity. Um, okay. that, that is a, a heavy lift. I mean, um, uh, a lot of the sometimes you know, inmates will have a lot of underlying medical conditions, and so there can be a lot of records to look through if you're auditing um, um, uh, the medical records for um, the corrections and institutions. So, um, and again, we will do that in collaboration with um, the commissioner uh, of, uh, of corrections because um, we have to, as I mentioned before, we have to work together. So it has to be a partnership. We're all on the same team here. And so as city government, we have to really work together to move things forward. Um, and I think that could be a, a, a good opportunity for us to really uh, leverage resources between the health department and the correction of medicine. For example, when individuals are um, being discharged, I mean, it's oftentimes they may need to be correct, connected to social support services or uh, medication tr assisted treatment, those types of things. And so the health department has those connections and a lot of times and those are already in place, but there's no system um, that has been established to make sure that individuals are connected to the resources that they need upon discharge. Um, so I think there are there could be there more opportunities for us to really leverage resources to make sure those who are um, uh, just as involved are, are have an opportunity to achieve optimal health and uh, achieve self sufficiency upon discharge. Uh, thank you for confirming that with me because I'm real big on collaborations, especially 
amongst city departments. We've been too parochial for way too long. It's their problem, it's their problem. And when we work together, we realize that sometimes we duplicate services and we can actually collaborate and streamline processes. So that's good to know so that we can consider that when we're looking at this new budget cycle coming up, if we really want to reimagine public safety and how we can, you know, better, you know, serve the inmates. Um, that is something we should seriously consider. And I'm frankly one that's tired of saying, you know, this is something that we should be doing, but we never fund it. I shouldn't say never. We rarely fund good ideas. Um, we just keep kicking a can down the road. So I will be looking um, into that as we look at the new budget cycle and whoever's a chairperson of Ways and Means to make sure but it's a priority. Hopefully it will be a priority for whoever the new mayor is. Um, it seems that it should be because that's their platform. So thank you again, Dr. Eccles, for all the hard work that you do for the city of St. Louis. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the task force members, I know that Dr. Walker is not uh, able to join us today. I would ask, first of all, Brad, do you have any questions of Dr. Eccles before we move it to, to other task force members? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So we we'll go around. I don't see any hand. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, uh, Mr. Pruitt. Yes. Hey, Dr. Eccles, just a couple of questions. Number one, are you or your staff or your department a part of the CCJC? Yes. Yeah, so we have um, a couple of my staff that participate in that, um, uh, in that regularly. So uh, Craig Smith, who's our policy uh, staff, um, and I meet with him uh, every week um, to get updates. And so um, there's good communication about what's happening on the CJCC and the health department is involved to help um, uh, ensure that there's a health focus um, in the initiative that they're putting pushing forward. So second question is, we've gotten testimony, no, actually not testimony, when uh, the task force members toured the facility, uh, of course, when we got to this, this issue about the holding cells, and the conditions that uh, uh, the detainees were being held in. And I know you've been on here uh, this morning most of the time. So you heard the testimony from the police department and they echoed or reinforced that uh, the, some of the conditions and that the detainees under their care are subject to and, and those have, all of those have health implications. So how do we, how do we ensure that those individuals that are that are held under those conditions have an opportunity to uh, file complaints and stuff with the health department and health department not just simply call over the, to the commissioner. And he says, oh, I'm gonna take a look at it because the way they made it sound, the commissioner is well aware of the overcrowding and all the other things that's going on in holding. And 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 it's and it's and I'm assuming you, you you this is the first time you're hearing about this, so I'm trying to understand is how do we fix that disconnect? Because if they if there are some serious health conditions over there that that if you were aware of or your department of world you would address, and you're hearing these for the first time from this testimony and and and, and others. How do you see, or what would you see the role of the department in, in bridging that gap? How do we bridge that gap? Because at the end of the day, aren't you, while they under the direct care of the corrections department and under the health, under the vendor that provides the health services, but at the end of the day, to ensure that everybody, uh, uh, how do I say it? To ensure that those facilities of following and instituting the right health protocols as relates to detainees. Isn't that your department's responsibility to sort of make sure that folks are doing what it is they're supposed to be doing? Well, to a certain extent, so related to health related issues. So I think some of the comments that were made earlier uh, are outside of the purview of the health department. Um, what my responsibility is, is making sure that I have good communication with Commissioner Glass and his team. And to my, my experience has been that they're extremely responsive 
Um, but it is also to the point where I'll get up and I'll walk over to the Justice Center and meet with them in person just to make sure things are resolved because um, health is important, not only for those outside of the Justice Center, but those who are in the Justice Center for whatever reason. Um, and so that's just my, my approach. I can't speak to what's happening in other agencies or some of the logistical issues that are outside beyond the purview of uh, the health department. Um, but any health related issue, I can speak on like the complaints that we've received we have followed up with uh, Commissioner Grass. They've been extremely responsive for us. So I can't speak to what's happening, you know, the communication between other other uh, agencies, um, but we um, we take health very seriously. And so again, if I have to leave my office and go in, and, and meet with them in person, even on the weekends, after hours, what have you, uh, we make sure we do that. And again, they've been extremely responsive. Well, I'm not I'm not I'm not speaking necessarily to the things that are not under mm -hmm. your purpose. Or, or let me ask this. If there's a holding cell that is a certain size and they have 20 people in there on top of each other, one open toilet facility, one uh, wash basin, and they're piled in there at like, like the slaves in the belly of the slave ships, is that a health department issue or is that a corrections issue? I think we have to understand the protocols that are in place for holding individuals in the holding area. Um, and so I think there may be some standards that have been established by, by the um, uh, uh, institution that give, that create these standards for correction, correctional institutions. Um, so that's something that I have to, I'll have to look into. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what those standards are right at this point in time. So I, I can't comment on those, but um, I know with COVID-19, our recommendation was for people to be more socially distant. So, you know, limiting uh, limiting the number of people in a particular um, unit uh, uh, to prevent transmission if necessary. But also, we also made sure that there were um, screening protocols in place for individuals that were um, in being processed. So if someone told them that, hey, I'm, I'm positive for COVID-19, um, we will verify that information um, by looking it up in our system because we have reports for everyone that tests positive in the city of St. Louis. If, for example, if by chance the individual was not a, um, a city resident, they lived in another, another jurisdiction, we, the health department will have, will have to reach out to that jurisdiction to see if that individual test, tested positive. And if they were a recent positive, then there's a protocol in place for them to be properly managed. And then if they, are, if they tested positive, say more than 90 days ago, um, then there's a protocol in place for them as well. So um, there are protocols in place, but as, as it relates to standards for the holding area, that's something that I, I will need to look into. Okay, and I just want to make overall, but wouldn't you say that, so let me say, is overcrowdedness of detainees in a particular area, whether it's a holding cell or whatever, is overcrowdedness a health, is adverse, is a health, is an adverse health issue? Would you say, would you say that is, from a health standpoint, that is a problem. Is that is that or is that not a health concern? So, from a health standpoint, it's not ideal. However, um, we have to understand the the root causes of the. What, if there's a bottleneck that's creating these overcrowded situations, we need to understand what that actually is. And so, I think doing mapping out what's actually happening um, in the uh, holding area is going to will be, um, I think, an important next step so individuals can understand um, what issues are causing um, overcrowding. Uh, in the just in the in the holding areas, if it's uh, not uh, improper communication or lack of communication that needs to be addressed, if there's um, other issues that are causing uh, uh, this to occur, we need to really know, understand what that is. Otherwise, we will be rec making recommendations blindly, and then we don't, and and we and that will essentially result in wasting tax, taxpayer dollars. And so we actually map out what's happening, and have a, a, a meeting of the minds, if you will. So having a meeting with the law, the police department with corrections and even the health department, uh, it can be a, you on, on a virtual platform that can give us some insight as far as what needs to happen to prevent overcrowding in those spaces. Um, but to just for, for me to make, make a recommendation without understanding all, all yeah. the, the, um, uh, the moving parts, um, that would be, uh, that would be unwise. I mean, but I, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just, I'm, I'm really just trying to understand <clears throat> as relates to where you look at things, or, or I'm assuming that the health department is looking at things as relates to how they impact the health of individuals. 
the, the causes, of course, you have to look at as relates to making recommendations to resolve it. But but once the but as, as relates to determining that it is a health issue, it is adverse health issues for individuals, no more than you doing a diagnosis as a doctor. You 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 you're looking at the symptoms or the conditions and you're saying whether this is healthy or unhealthy. So I'm just trying to understand that is overcrowding this, especially in tight confined areas of individuals who are strangers to everybody. And they may have went through some initial health screening going in and all of this other stuff. But would you consider 10, 12, 15 people crammed into a 10 by 10 space to be healthy or unhealthy, a healthy condition or unhealthy condition as relates to the cause of it and how we resolve it is one thing. I'm just trying to make a determination whether that condition is healthy or unhealthy. So, think, so that can be health implications related to overcrowding. That's okay. that's clear. So that's okay. just living in a congregate living facility or congregate setting uh, increases the risk just in general for you know, contracting respiratory illness, um, such as COVID, the flu, common cold, um, because you're in a confined space and close quarters and so um, that's that's an issue not only for the holding area, but that's the issue for the entire system. And so making sure we understand, um, uh, again, I think under, understanding why certain things are happening is really critical. And so we, we in the health department, you know, uh, we use an evidence informed approach. And so we have to obtain as much information as possible to understand what the root cause of the issue is. And then we develop um, uh, solutions um, based on the information and the data that's been collected. And so I think that's another a, 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 an approach that needs to be um, implemented to address this situation. Last question. And if you determine that that overcrowdedness or whatever is a health concern, what, and is in the corrections facility, what, what authority and power do you or your department has to uh, abate that situation? So again, you have, you have to understand what the capacity limitations are. So if you have, you only have two cells to hold people, you know, what are you going to do, right? So we have to understand, we have to work closely with um, Commissioner Glass and his team uh, to make sure that um, whatever solution is identified is actually um, reasonable and realistic. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, any other task force members have any questions? Uh, Dr. Eccles, I do want to piggyback because I, I, I understand your, uh, your, your answer. I'm, I'm very clear about your answer. Okay. Uh, and we want to thank you for the work that you do. Uh, uh, phenomenal work in the community. Uh, I, I, I'm, like, like Mr. Pruitt, I still want to, I want to, I, I want to be clear, clearer. Uh, because what we're hearing, as Mr. Pruitt has indicated, we are hearing from multiple sources that the second floor holding cells uh, are problematic from the standpoint of health. Uh, that's what we, you know, we've heard that on a consistent basis. Uh, notwithstanding the reasons for the bottleneck, as you've indicated, because you're, you're absolutely right, there could be a reason on one end uh, to cause the bottleneck where it is on that second floor. And you've indicated that uh, when identifying that issue on the second floor, it is up to uh, the correction staff to determine how to deal with it on the other end. Uh, based upon your hearing that there might be issues as it relates to occupancy mm -hmm. uh, in the holding cells, as Dr. Pruitt said, uh, 30 people in a cell that should accommodate 12 people. Once you hear that, once you hear that concern, what is your next step? What would be the procedure from, from, from the health department? So the next step would be to, <clears throat> to work with Com Commissioner Glass, so to actually go on site to see what the protocol okay. runs. That's, so one of the things I'm gonna ask uh, this group to allow me to do is to go meet with um, Commissioner Glass and his team again, walk through specifically the second floor, the protocols that have been outlined, and also the standards that have been established for holding uh, individuals, uh, and then uh, 
report our findings back to this group so that you all can also make an informed decision uh, about what needs to what needs to happen. Um, and the one, one thing that wasn't discussed is, I know what the focus is the Justice Center, but we also have to be mindful that uh, the Medium Security Institute is still open. Um, so part of what I'm also scheduling to do with um, Commissioner Glass and his team is to go to uh, the Medium Security Institute as well to do a walkthrough um, because uh, some of the same precautions related to COVID that have been implemented in uh, the Justice Center also need to be implemented in the uh, in, in MSI, uh, but the infrastructure is a little different. And so um, I'd like to come have another opportunity to come back and issue a report to you all about the findings in MSI and the steps that we can take to make that um, as safe as possible while it's still open. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Echoes. Any questions from task force members? Excellent. Dr. Eccles, once again, thank you very much for your presentation. It has been enlightening. And again, thank you for the work that you do in, in our community to, to keep us healthy. God bless you, man. You be safe. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. And now I believe we do have, uh, I know that Mr. Hickley is on and thank you very much, Christopher, for being patient with us. Uh, we're trying to do a, a thorough job uh, with what the, the mayor has tasked us to do uh, and your participation and presence uh, here today uh, is extremely valuable. So I would ask you if you would identify yourself uh, and as we've asked the other uh, participants uh, and, and particularly as it relates to uh, the circuit attorney's relationship uh, as far as intake of detainees uh, and the, the length of stay of detainees and so the relationship. So Mr. Hickley, if you would introduce yourself and your position, you have the floor, sir. Thank you again. Good morning, Reverend Gray. And thank you task force mem members for having me uh, come uh, before you and, and hopefully um, educate and uh, answer your questions uh, to your satisfaction. Um, I think it's probably best. Uh, well, my name is Christopher Hinckley, and uh, I am Ms. Gardner's chief warrant officer. And the warrant office is where it's really the front door, the intake um, for the court process in a criminal uh, criminal case. The police bring, uh, used to be in person, but now remotely bring their uh, evidence uh, to uh, the warrant office for assessment and a decision as to whether or not uh, uh, arrest warrants uh, or search warrants will be issued. Um, and I oversee a, a number of attorneys uh, that both handle uh, serious and violent crimes, homicides and violent crimes, uh, sex crimes, child abuse, uh, um, uh, domestic violence, um, and then general felonies um, in this uh, intake process. The, it's important to note that um, we have some influence on how everything happens prior to, uh, the, the case getting to us, um, in that we, uh, I'll tell you that the cases come to us in two ways. If the person, if the crime is a violent crime or the person is a violent offender, a problem offender, the police are instructed to apply within 24 hours. So they have 24 hours to get that person and everything in before us because we think it's important to uh, get that case before a judge to set a bond. Um, and possibly if in the case of very violent offenses, you know, uh, detain that person till trial. Uh, the vast majority of cases are what are called for the uh, for police lingo pause, released pending application of warrant. Those persons, and this might tie into a little bit of what you were talking about before, Dr. Eccles, those people are designated pause by the police and they are brought in, they have to be booked. So they'll often be held with everybody else on the second floor, as you know, Reverend, and then released. So they're marked paw, but they gotta be booked and then they're quickly ushered out. And they're pawed or quickly released because we list all those other lower level felonies without victims, no crime, no problem, problem offenders, as things that we're not gonna take within 24 hours. And we don't want you holding somebody um, beyond 24 hours or beyond two hours, in fact. It should be about two hours. Uh, and uh, 
uh, Colin and Lieutenant Benoit will, could, uh, can tell you more about that, how quickly they get them out and how we work together to make sure that we get them booked and get them out. So those people will then come to our office through what's called a drop-off queue that we've set up remotely. But this is really just a mirror of what happens in real life as well, in person. They drop those cases off after releasing the offender. So the vast majority of cases, uh, simply because there's a larger number of C, D, and E felonies, um, get dropped off. They go into a queue and they're reviewed as they, uh, oftentimes uh, I'll pull cases up front that need to be looked at because they could be uh, someone has developed into a problem offender or, you know, there was an oversight or it's just straight by time. You go back to the last uh, one submitted and go look at it first. Those cases are then reviewed by um, my staff and um, if they are uh, issuable, they are, a complaint is issued with a probable cause statement and a, war and a warrant request, which goes to the court. The judge sets an initial bond setting, and then it goes uh, to the prisoner processing and I believe um, corrections, if the person's gonna be held and be held on the bond. Very shortly thereafter, as a result of the new rules, there'll be a 16B hearing, which some um, of you may be familiar with. And that's a review of everything that's happened right up until that point. And by, by that time, often, there's a lot of information The pretrial is brought to the court's attention and the courts will often, uh, uh, well, let's just say that the, the cases that are dropped off, the ones without the victims and the ones without the violence, they are often quick you know, released with some form of bond uh, with some, maybe some conditions. The, a large part of the violent offenders that are looked at within 24 hours, a I would say a good, a good portion of them are initially held but we see, we've seen uh, instances of them getting uh, bonds as well with the number of uh, uh, restrictions that the court's able to put on a, an offender who is on bond. And depending on the circumstances of the case, we've seen those cases get released on bond as well. Uh, we also have the option, and we just utilize this really with the C, D, and E felonies to, uh, to issue our case with a summons. So the person actually that was release pending application of warrant, they'll get something in the mail uh, saying that you have for your first court date is this day. So they never actually have to go back to prison, um, excuse me, the justice center, unless they fail to fail to appear in a warrants issued. Um, that's why we encourage everybody to give us your correct address. <laughs> uh, then uh, from there, uh, the cases get assigned to preliminary hearing or grand jury. The anything that with a victim, uh, I remember I, I always tell everyone this, we, we're about this close to losing our victims in the Warren office. We're about this close from losing our witnesses in the Warren office, you know, if they're it, it, on these mo most of these dangerous offenses. So um, I am very careful with uh, victims and eyewitnesses to dangerous offenses. So I send the cases to the grand jury uh, where the, there will be no defendant sitting there and defense attorney uh, cross-examining them. That's uh, oftentimes the only way we can get the people to participate. The grand jury uh, will then hear the case and indict the uh, hand down an indictment or a no true bill. The cases that are dropped off with no victims those cases are often, if not almost always sent to preliminary hearings. And the preliminary hearing docket moves pretty quick. As you know, that's where the defendant will be with his attorney and there's an ability to cross-examine. We don't like to send victims there because they're in, in, when, we do, when we do ask them on certain cases, they say, no, I'd rather just, let's just let it go. So we, we try, occasionally we try to get some more cases into preliminary hearing but uh, as you can, as you might imagine, Reverend, it's very difficult to, um, uh, and, and our obligations are, you know, statutory to victims, our obligations are statutory. The, you know, we have a real uh, um, obligation to look out for the victims, to keep them informed, um, to sometimes amass their identity. Uh, and we take that, that uh, obligation very seriously. And, you know, we're, we're also aware of the, um, it's not, we just, I just want to make clear that, you know, we are, 
uh, Miss Gardner and I, uh, you know, have come up with summons releases, something that was never, you know, really done much before. And we do it uh, on a number of cases. Um, and that's to keep down the jail population. We've met with the public defender on a number of occasions to identify cases that we can move or that we can reduce the bonds on uh, to reduce the uh, population of the Justice Center and or MSI. And those um, and that 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 was even before COVID, but we stepped up our efforts with the public defender, uh, Mr. Mahaffey, um, after COVID kicked in. And frankly, you know, we we took some hits, um, but that's all right. We 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 always know those are coming. There's no there's no lack of <laughs> hits coming our way. <laughs> um, uh, maybe, uh, Reverend, maybe I should just turn it over to questions because I'm, I'm not sure how much I can talk about the uh, detention aspect. I think you're on mute. Uh, Reverend. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to uh, uh, recognize uh, the Alderman Vaccaro in a minute. But one, you know, one thing, and I, I don't know, Chris, if you if you saw one of our mandates uh, is uh, to review the need to begin moving cases through the 22nd Judicial circuit and any other measures possible to address the isolation uncertainty resulting from the halting of court cases for nearly one year due to the, the COVID pandemic. So, so you're, you're, you're talking right in our, uh, uh, yeah. right in the area. So we do appreciate that. One thing I wanna ask, uh, and I'll get my head together, how, how, as far as speedy trial is concerned, how important is, tra is the transportation of detainees. And I know that we're only talking about from one building to another building, but uh, how important is it for those detainees to make that first, is, it the, is the first part, the preliminary hearing going from the, from the justice center to the court? If they miss that preliminary hearing, not for no fault of their own, they're, they're detained, but yeah. something's, happening, something's happening in the system and they don't get transported the, the, the hour that they're supposed to. How, how critical is that? Well, I think there's a, just to let you know, the court might be better suited to answer it. Okay. I, I, I just know that the, that's not gonna count against them. I mean, if it's not their, you know, if they're on bond and they don't show up, there'll be a warrant. But if, right. they, are, if they are detained, they are supposed to be transported uh, because we put in the request for a writ for now, right now they're being transported to appear on video. So it's much easier to, to move that to the video appearances. And uh, I rarely, um, gosh, uh, Reverend, I, if it's become an issue, I'll have to look into it um, to see what we can do. But I think that the only thing that we might be, if we're, if anybody's remiss on our end, it would be not submitting the request for transportation to get to the Granger. If so, I, it, but that would be a surprise to me. I, I, I know we've, we're, we're in the middle of some discussions with the sheriff about the procedures on that, but that's just the procedures, not necessarily that anybody's missing a court date. I'd be shocked. I mean, that, as long as we have uh, people in custody, there's no reason to miss a court date. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Vaccaro. So, uh, and you may or may not know the answer to this, uh, but I, people that are just, in our custody that are just ready to plead that yeah. does not need a jury trial. I'm being yeah. told that uh, they're not, that, that I guess there's some, uh, I'm trying to think of the way without insulting or doing anything. Uh, <laughs> well, between their defense, their, their, their attorneys and the prosecutor's office to allow them to plea and move on. Okay. I'm being told that, uh, that, that there just seems to be a problem there. And, and maybe you, know, you hear stuff that's true or untrue, but is there a lot, I mean, how many people are ready to go that don't even need a jury trial that could just plea that a lot of them probably will get time served. Some of them have been in there two and three years. I think. Well, I would hope that anybody that uh, is being held and is willing to plea would be able to would would get that done right away. The the if they're if 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 any any 
let's say I'm the defense attorney, not necessarily the public defender, but defense attorney um, in, in whole. If my client rec relates to me that they are willing to plea, I communicate with the court to put him on a plea docket or to put him on the docket for a plea. And then he's brought over and we're, they're capable of pleading and being released on probation or um, uh, sent to penitentiary. It, it's, it's, um, I have to believe, Alderman Vicaro, that anybody that would plead right now and get probation should should likely not be in custody. But there's exceptions to everything. I, um, but if a, if a defense attorney wants to plead their client, if there's a, there might be something where they're not sure what the plea agreement is, or they, they want a plea agreement, and that's something that we have to uh, work on with them. But if not, they're capable of pleading their client directly to the court without the state's input. So, and, and again, you know, cause it's all hearsay, nothing, yeah. you know, that I, you know, <clears throat> I was told that some of the people that are willing to plea that Kim has to personally review them. And it's, and I'm hearing this from people that work within that and that, uh, that it slows the they process down her and she doesn't quite get there to, to, to do that. And, and again, it's hearsay. It's not anything that I can say, gee, you know, but, uh, you know, I've been told that, uh, you know, by a couple of different attorneys that, uh, you know, so I don't know if there's any truth to that. Um, you know, that, that, that all the plea deals have to go directly through her and there's a big delay in getting. Okay. Her to look at, but again, that, that uh, you know, I mean, if there's people ready to move on, I mean, there, there's a lot of cases that could be heard, you know, even without a, a jury. And, and I guess my concern oh, yeah. is that it's out there. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Alderman Vaccaro. Uh, I will, I've written down some notes on that. Uh, uh, I think I can garner from what you said that, you know, you believe there to be or what you've heard is that, and I'll just, I'm trying to summarize it, like a bottleneck preventing uh, the a bottleneck uh, with getting some uh, rules with Miss Gardner uh, that preventing pleas. Preventing yeah. the ex, you know, ex, ex, expedited right. pleas. Right. I, I, I'm just, I, I would be taking that to Miss Gardner. I'm not okay. concluding that, okay? No, I, I agree. And, and, and again, it, it, it's hearsay, it's not a fact. What I'm told is some people are ready to plea, but okay. she wants to review. I, I, that'd be great be if we wrong. get that done. Could be wrong. Okay. That, that would be All great right. if we could get that done, Mr. Uh, Alderman Vaccaro. Oh, I'm, I'm All right. okay. Thank you. All right. Brad, did you have your hand up or is it, would it just be from the previous person? I think that's carryover. I have nothing. Oh. Okay. Uh, I have Mr. Pruitt and then Senator Nasheed. Hey, Chris, uh, yeah. really appreciate you being here. I Thank just you. want to make sure. I have some other questions, but I want to make sure we clear one thing up. If a detainee is interested in entering a plea, mm -hmm. that is something that his attorney, his or her attorney, would have to indicate to you all because you all are not allowed to talk directly to that detainee without their attorney being present. Am I right or wrong? Oh, that's correct. We don't speak with them. If they want to, we don't take their calls. <laughs> uh, and we don't take calls from their family members either, because that's effectively talking to them. So we uh, rely upon the defense attorney to tell us what the intent of the defendant is. And are you aware of any, you you all are a member of the C CCJC also, right? Yeah. Are you, are at, in any of those meetings, have any issues as relates to what we're talking about now of, of, of folks who wishing to enter a plea and it's taking forever to get that done, come before the CCJC? Uh, I'm, I'm not, I have not attended a number of, a lot of meetings because of work, okay. my obligations, but I have yet to hear from, uh, they will call me when, uh, to come to meetings when issues like this would arise and I have yet to be called on this matter. Got it. And as relates to the holding areas, You've been you've been listening in for yes. most of the yeah. So as it relates to the holding areas when they're in police custody on the first floor or even on the second, second floor, floor, 
Right. That has nothing to do with your office. Am I right or no, wrong? Nothing. Nothing to do. So no, anything that, we've tried to expedite over. that. Yeah. Right. We've tried to help where we can, but the persons that can really that can really comment on that are, are Colin uh, Tully and uh, Lieutenant Benoit. They can really tell you like the mechanics of it, why it might get backed up at, at certain times and reasons for that. But uh, your office has nothing to do no. with and, and you just simply when the case is presented, you either charge or don't charge. Correct. Now, Okay, and and is has there been to, to your knowledge any instances that you could since you are the one who issues the warrants where the police have applied for warrants on someone and it took you all longer than twenty four hours to say yes or no? Uh, very rarely, but and that's all, often due to the officer bringing the case with. Uh, uh, it could be for whatever reason, you know, lack of sleep or, you know, mistake. The officer, if the officer brings the case to us with not, not enough time left, like they'll, if it's 24 hour clock and they drop the case off at two hours left and we got to find an attorney to get it done. Sometimes the 24 hours might expire, but on the most serious cases, we did, that does not happen. Uh, so, the, correct, I, I want to make sure I'm clear not to cut you up. So when the 24 hours expire, or you, or if they've been held longer than that, who's making that decision? Is it the circuit attorney's office, the police, the corrections? Who, who, who is responsible if they're being detained after that 24 hour period expire and you all have not issued any warrants? The police. Okay. Got they're they're so, responsible for cutting that loose. That's a law. So okay. yeah, we, they will call us. Uh, they're very good about calling us to say, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got when the time is ticking down? Um, as much, it, uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, I don't know why somebody would be held beyond 24 hours. And it's yeah. not our obligation to call up and say, release or don't release. That's not got our it. obligation. Got it. And, and as relates to this issue of detainees being upset and the cause for the uprising because of this prolonged stay within the the the, uh, the, uh, the CJC uh, because they haven't went to trial or anything like that. Uh, if they apply, let's say it differently. If they have applied for a speedy trial, say say that uh, uh, somebody's in there and they've advised their attorney, say I want to go to trial as soon as possible, and they make that filing. That, does that or does not that filing also come to your office? Yes, and then they go on to a, uh, the court identifies it as a speedy trial and it's disposition minus defense attorney uh, continuances or minus some other, you know, well, the fact we don't have jurors, <laughs> uh, m minus, you know, any of those things, the, the, the case would be seen or go to trial immediately within 180 days. And, and, the determination after they apply for the speedy trial, the determination as relates to when that trial occurs or does not occur. In other words, the length of time it takes for that trial to occur, is that the responsibility of the courts or the or, or the uh, circuit attorney's office? Who, no, the, who, the, the court. public defenders? Who, who determines, who's the traffic cop that determines when the light goes from red to green? The defendant uh, turns the light on, and then the uh, court becomes the you know the really the traffic guard. You know, this defense circuit attorney uh, at that point gets ready for the case to go to trial, and that's it. We just get ready because we'll have to go at any time. We have no control over when the court will call it up, so that's why we had to get ready right away. Okay. And the last question is: is that earlier, and of course this is public, we had testimony from the public defender's office and they had a list of recommendations and issues that they raised. And a lot of them centered around uh, uh, this preliminary hearing versus uh, uh, a complaint versus uh, grand jury. And I think you spoke to that earlier. Um, um, and, and they, so would you, uh, would you describe and I'm asking this only because they raised it as an issue. Will you describe the relationship, the inherent relationship between the public defender's office and representing defendants and the circuit attorney's office 
representing victims. What is what is that relationship? Well, um, is it ever isn't naturally it adversarial? Yeah, I, I think it. I think it is. You know, it, it doesn't have to be. Sometimes, I mean, we can work towards a common. Uh, the, I think that we we all want to see justice happen. Justice happen as soon as possible. But but there are certain things we can't sacrifice, Mr. Pruitt, and that's the you know safety of victims and the safety of our citizens. So there are a lot of cases that you know will have to take a little bit longer, and uh, those cannot be cases in which I decide. Uh, oh, I'll 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 wait till. Um, I'm not going to issue a, a complaint because this person, even though I have probable cause uh, to believe they occurred it, and they're they're out there threatening the victims or the victims, you know, or are still out there, that I'm going to wait until the, the, the grand jury date when they get indicted and arrested. That's irresponsible, and I think that they'd agree. Mr. Chair, one last question. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yes. This this is it, uh, Mr. Inkley. I, I've heard as it relates to COVID and and detainees and co detainees feel that because of COVID, there should be some releases and things of this nature. And so I've heard that that the circuit attorney's office and the public defender's office had a, had a discussion as relates to releasing detainees early because of COVID. And my understanding was that when you all asked the public defender's office as it relates to who should go early everybody. and who shouldn't, that the response was, we want everybody released. Everybody. Every, we, is that, is that we, correct? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's what was stated, but that's expected. Um, and, it's kind of like... Regardless of what they were charged with? <laughs> correct, correct. So, All right, I'm done. Yeah. It, yeah. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Senator Nasheed, you have the floor. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chris, how are you today? Good, Senator, how Long are you? Long time no see, I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> My good friend. So listen, um, now we talked a little bit about uh, those individuals uh, who were waiting to uh, go to court. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard uh, throughout our time here about uh, in, uh, instances where it takes two to three years. They're just waiting in there for one, two to three years. Okay. And so my question to you, Chris, is this here. Um, is that true? Do we have in, uh, detainees that are inside uh, uh, um, the uh, Justice Center that have been there for one or two years waiting to go to court? Oh, waiting to go to court? Well, they've been to court a number of times, I would think, in one to two years, Senator. But as opposed, if you're saying waiting to go to court, meaning waiting for disposition of their case? Yeah. Yeah, okay, for final disposition or case? Yes, I think that there's probably detainees so that have... Is, is yeah. that normal or do, I mean, because a lot of them basically, a lot of them basically say that they are constantly having continuations. And so, uh, and, and some of them believe that their continuations is to bust them, to make them break so that they can plead guilty. Oh. And so, and so th this is what I, I've heard. And so my question to you is this here, uh, how many of those individuals um, do you know of have filed speedy trials and still went over the a hundred day, uh, 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 hundred eighty days, right? Um, uh, eight hundred eighty days. Well, I think that you know the, the as I've seen it, that it varies, Senator, because that that can be extended uh, by the defense counsel of continuing, and 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 then therefore it can go over, or that can be uh, con you know continued by the court if there's just cause. So I don't see a lot of them, but we, you know, but we do see it, uh, you know, uh, on occasion that uh, even though it's a speedy trial, that it goes beyond the 180 days. But that's not anything, as I was explaining before, that's not it. That's, it, that's nothing to do with our office. We don't control whether or not that once that speedy trial is filed, we, 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 are, we have to be ready to, for it to go within that time period. OK, so if this if it goes over 180, will that be considered violating uh, that individual's uh, no. uh, rights? No, 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 only if the only if it's the state that that caused it to go over and then the case would be dismissed okay so the only way uh, senator that it can go over is a reason uh that it, the defense defense says that like a continuance um, and that happens quite a bit because they frankly they want to get it done but they're not necessarily ready um and it takes a lot when you have uh defense counsel with a lot of cases um so 
will those cases in general get, get get completed before other ones? Yes, but will they happen within 180 days? Um, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. So how, how many how many cases do you you all have per year coming through your office? Uh, Ten thousand. Ten thousand. How many uh, attorneys do you all have it within the? Uh, um, assigned to me, I have uh, at any one time um, four. And how many cases do you have coming through you? I handle search warrants and sometimes I handle cases. I don't have, I don't handle a number of cases just because of my schedule, but I, I do a lot of traffic directing. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you all, um, I guess, uh, Kim's been working very hard, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, trying to figure out a way to not just incarcerate, you know, but find yeah. other uh, mechanisms and, and avenues. Tell me a little bit about uh, uh, the programs that you all have uh, within the within the uh, circuit attorney's office. Well, we have the, uh, um, first of all, one of the efforts we've used in, this, in the warrant office, which I can speak with the most education to, uh, is um, the use of summonses to, that won't necessarily expedite the disposition, but it will, you know, relieve uh, the justice center and the police from having to um, hold on to the uh, offender. Um, and uh, we otherwise will offer, I identify cases in the warrant office, uh, and then there's a review after me as well. I identify cases that I see where a person is a non violent offender and has a limited criminal history. Um, and often it's, it's uh, drugs or some, for some reason, dummy carrying a gun with drugs or something, I will refer them to what's called a diversion queue for uh, diversion, one of our diversion programs. Now, I don't know the names of all the diversion programs. Ms. Gardner would be better at explaining that, but they will take them from me or sometimes even take them um, before a case gets to me. I'll take it and look at it and say, do we really even want to charge this person um, and bring it to Ms. Gardner? And we've done that before as well. But the diversion programs Ms. Gardner has from the drug education program to job to mental health counseling, those people will then go through all those programs. And upon graduation, the uh, depending on whether it's pre-plea or post-plea, they will be uh, plea withdrawn and case dismissed, or they'll never have pled and the case will be dismissed. Uh, you're muted, Senator. Thanks, Chris. Yo, you're welcome. Are there any uh, other task force members who have questions for Chris? Chris, I have, I, I guess, and you may have already answered this. Uh, you know, once again, we're looking at, uh, you know, what can be done. We know we have an overcrowded situation at the Justice mm -hmm. Center. We're, our job is to, to look at what can be done uh, to decrease those numbers based upon those who are currently being detained. Uh, and you may have already answered it. In your opinion, what would your department need to move detainees through the system more rapidly? And you may have already answered it. It may be you know, more plea agreements or whatever, but from your department, I guess everybody has a role to play in this. And, You've, you talked about the courts would, would probably be in a, in a better position to deal with the scheduling part. Yeah. But if, if there was something, if there were a recommendation that you could make to this task force that would be forwarded to the, the mayor and uh, the Department of Public Safety, we have the chair of the Public Safety Committee on here, what would, what would that recommendation or recommendations look like? Oh, um... It's difficult for us to, you know, think about how we can reduce the time list because we don't have a lot of control over how long the people are detained other than just get ready for trial. Okay. Um, I would encourage, uh, I'm just, but again, oh. stepping, stepping back, I would encourage, you know, the open communication about clients willing to plead because they can waive with the, those steps that I told before right. about the grand jury and the preliminary hearing. They can waive those if they'd like to uh, receive a sentence, whether it be a short amount of jail time or longer, or right. um, or pro to get them into a probation program. Um, and I think that would be the the one thing I've 
we've recommended in the past and tried to implement. So I have some, some knowledge of it that I mm -hmm. feel comfortable recommending. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Chris, we appreciate the work that the circuit attorney is doing and, and her staff. We appreciate your patience. Uh, we appreciate your patience this morning. <laughs> and uh, I mean, this is important. I think that people, I'm, I'm hoping people understand that right now, our job is to try to validate and recommend immediate, you know, uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have a, as my grandmother would say, we really don't have a dog in this fight. We just want to make yeah. sure that what is being done is in the best interest of the detainees and the staff included. So we thank you very much for your, for your input in your presentation. And don't release we, everybody. Don't, <laughs> we, we don't, but just to let you know, we are trying to get back to jury trials. And, uh, but don't and release look, everybody. No, we're, uh, uh, that's not... That's not in the cards. Uh, thank but, you, uh, everybody. But what, but Chris, when you say that, when you say, you know, we're trying to get back to, to jury trials. And yes. Just, uh, yeah. What steps? What steps could the circuit attorney take to, to, to get to those jury t trials more rapidly? Is that is that something that you have within your authority to do? Or is that somebody else has got to open that door? The, co the co Supreme Court has to open the door. Supreme okay. Court has to say, you're at level whatever. And I... I think it's two or something. I, and and then there's a practical, Reverend, there's a, always a practical thing. Can you get enough jurors to say, with all the protections that might be put in place, I was able to keep the grand jury going by moving it and completely restructuring it and making a remote operation so I could keep cases going through the grand jury. Um, the, the, but that was under my purview. The, the courts you know, will govern how the jury trials will go. And I just think it's going to be very at least initially, it's, it might be difficult, even though all the protections are placed to get jurors to, to agree, to say, yeah, I'll, I'll spend a week with other people. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. yeah. so I don't know, we're trying. The, the, I think we're gonna try soon. So we're all trying right. to, our best to expedite these things. Can't Thank they, you very much. Go ahead, they, go ahead, Alderman. Can't they do like the federal does where rather than bring three or 400 people and put them in a room, Yeah. You call in, and unless you're actually being with a boy, boy, whatever they, however they pronounce that, they only call those people in. So if there is a trial and they have to be, uh, well, we we just uh, Alderman, the, 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 they're they're making an effort at it. Uh, that's up to the court how it's going to be conducted. We're willing to do it as long as the Supreme Court says you'll be safe. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, and the court's not going to have to. The court's not going to do it unless the Supreme Court says it as well. But th there's always there's there are ways. But uh, as you know, up until you know Supreme Court says so, we can't do anything. Oh, okay, I'm just curious. All right, I'm looking. I don't see any other hands up. So Chris, once again, thank you, thank you very much for participating. Thank you for your presence. It seems as though you've been with us almost all morning. We really appreciate no, I tried. That. I tried, Reverend. <laughs> Mr. Schiff, well, we appreciate it. Thank I'll you very much. It, Senator Mashid, Mr. Picaro, thank you for having me. Thank you, Reverend. sir. All right. So to the uh, task force members right now, we have on our agenda that we are scheduled to go into closed session uh, because we have some issues to discuss that relate to the security of the building. And the chair will entertain a motion to go... It's been moved. It's been moved by Alderman uh, Vaccaro. Is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded. Okay, seconded by uh, Mr. Pruitt. Uh, all in favor of the motion to go into closed session in order to discuss matters uh, that pertain to security, indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We will now go into uh, closed session. At, uh, at the end of that, we will return uh, to the public. Uh, section of our uh, discussion. So now we're going to ask everyone if you will kindly move into closed session. I guess we have to wait on that yeah, little thing. To... Gives us a thing. Yeah. All right. We're back in open session. Uh, the task force is going to recess for today. Uh, we will be back uh, in session tomorrow at 11 a.m. March the 12th. Uh, we will reconvene then. Uh, until then, uh, 
We don't need a motion to adjourn. We're just going to recess until 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. Mr. See Chairman. You. Mr. Chairman. Yes. yes. Uh, just to, just to, you know, for, for the record, uh, can yes. you just explain to us what are we going into uh, recessing for and what will, we, what will we be discussing tomorrow? Tomorrow we will be discussing the recommendations. Uh, and if we conclude that discussion, we will uh, tentatively be prepared to vote on the recommendations tomorrow. Uh, as I indicated earlier, if we are able to vote on the recommendations tomorrow, uh, then a presentation will be made to the mayor tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock. That is tentative based upon us being able to, to vote on the recommendations tomorrow morning. There will be a discussion. Uh, and then I understand following that discussion, uh, there'll be a motion to vote on the recommendations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. You're Chair. welcome. You're welcome. Thank you all very much. Looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow at 11 a.m.